All right, too kind, too kind. Who is all up for Claire to do the talk today? Because <laughs> I, I, that was breathtaking. It, it, it really was. Um, and so those are my closing thoughts. Um, I, I want to um, thank um, Dean Drummond, Professor Wagner, and also, um, although he's not here, um, Professor Gerald Torres, who has a dual appointment at the Yale Law School as well as the Yale School of Environment. They were really the, um, the catalyst that brought me um, here. Um, and so it was with the profundity of kind of gratitude that I want to express. I mean, my road to Yale is just uh, one that is in some ways fantastical to kind of think about. Um, and so, um, you know, when I was given the topic and we were kind of going back and forth on this, and so um, Sarah said, you know, what about um, the topic of the road to Emmaus? And um, I didn't know what the road to Emmaus was. Um, in fact, um, I was, I have several students um, that are in a dual program between divinity and School of Environment, I was corrected on how to pronounce Emmaus. Um, I've since worked with a team of linguists in Austria. <laughs> my um, my um, deficiencies were so profound, it will be in a journal next fall. Um, um, I've, so, I, you know, when I talk about this, I really want to um, talk about, you know, what I'm not in, in a way. I am not a theologian. I'm I am not someone um, that is a, um, a biblical scholar. Um, I'm not a divinity student. I am not even an academic. Um, uh, I am a practitioner. Um, I have worked with the communities that I've known. But what I am, and I know this for fact, I am a vessel, I am an instrument I am a prosthetic to do this work. Um, I come from a background that really instructs me um, before there were the vernaculars of servant leadership to be a custodian and servant um, to these communities. And so it really begs the question, why am I giving this lecture um, for you today? Um, and so to that, I wanna kind of share a bit of my background. Um, I'm a child of a single parent. Um, I think it is no stretch to say I grew up um, in an impoverished um, environment. The high school that I graduated currently has, um, I think the highest um, population of graduates, almost 80% living below poverty. I grew up um, knowing public assistance, public housing, um, and in many ways, it, while I did not know it then, um, my upbringing was very rough, and I mean physically rough. Um, it was something that I had to think about all the time. That said, I was not impoverished with love. I was not impoverished with leadership. I was not impoverished with cultural and moral instruction to tell me the road was before me. And so in many ways, my upbringing provided everything I needed to do to be successful in this life. Um, and much of this from, was from a cultural and kind of moral base. Um, much of it um, promulgated and reinforced by the, um, a very swift hand of my mom. My mom, um, is the fiercest person I know um, to this day that I know in person. She died about a year ago. And so when I think about what she provided me um, and the community I grew up in, it is with a profundity of gratitude because I understood early on what it meant to have um, kuleana, rights and responsibilities that having responsibility is tethered to a particular privilege and that we must execute it in a way that is righteous, that is morally conscious, that is culturally sensitive. Um, and so it is the reason why 
I thought when I was asked I could do this. Um, the mistake I made is I'm such a fanboy of Reverend Barber. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to give like a DNC like um, <laughs> kind of speech that he gave. You know, when people like 50,000 were roaring. About three minutes before I got to the stage, I was like, God, that was a mistake. I should have done like a PowerPoint. So, um, but I've been studying with Matthew Fox and N.T. Wright on biblical scripture for the last two months. Um, we have a biteable study. That's a hidden joke. Um, okay. Um, so, what do you know about me? I am a fairly... Um, ordinary person um, and I'm just doing the work that I know but I think that serves to instruct all of us we all have a place and that is what is so kind of I think portable and universal this concept of kuleana means that there is always a place for you that we need not be tethered to title and so um, if it's not here there's another space and that means also you're always part of a community. Think about it. The work always requires you. And so if you're not doing this particular thing, there's probably another space for you that is aligned and really fortified um, to you, your particular personality and skill set. And so that is why in class I always encourage that not just native people do this work. And in fact, we cannot do the work with the assistance of other people. And so there is always a space for you. So with that, let's dive into the road to Emmaus. Okay, I've given a sufficient amount of preface and caveat. Um, <laughs> with that, I want you to express that in terms of forgiveness if I get any of this wrong. So what's my initial takeaway? We have these two fellows, right? Um, and it's several days after Christ has died. And they are bantering about the events of the last several days. Um, and they're talking about Jesus. And there's a kind of, if you will, a gossip about, right? Now, we don't know the two fellows. They're not one of the known disciples. They are disciples, but at the time, not of the existing 11. And so they're talking about Jesus. And lo and behold, Jesus is before them. And Jesus is being attentive to what they're talking about. Imagine you and I, right? And we're walking and we're talking about seeing Dua Lipa and Elton John. And then Elton John comes right up over there. <laughs> and we're talking about Elton John. He's saying something about Tiny Dancer, this other thing about Crocodile Rock. But we're like, keep on going on, and we never make acknowledgment. That is the situation um, <laughs> that it's occurring. And so when I think about this, I think about the first thing that just jumps out at me is, what are the relationships that we have that we don't know that, are, that is right in front of us? They're so obvious, but for whatever reason, we have either an institutional, maybe a societal, an individual blinder to the very relationship that we relish, that we would like to embrace, but for some reason, it's out of our kind of vision and panoramic. And so when I think about this, I think about also a fresh kind of breeze of God's grace and how do we form and solidify relationships and foster not just faith, right, but to understand each other in a much more mature way. And so how do we then rethink these relationships and place them in a way that we can create a new iteration to that. Um, and so when we think about how we understand each other and how we come to a maturity from a spiritual level, from a cultural level, from an institutional level, I want you to keep that in mind because that will be a prevailing theme to this conversation um, today. So 
as I've read and reread Luke 24, um, something comes to mind, um, and that these two men, right, there's not a lot of description to them. And so one could even say they're pedestrian or commoners. And so let's take a pause there. We're at an institution, and what do we value? We value excellence. We value the exceptional, those outliers. And what we need to do at times is recalibrate what we're thinking about. Because when I think about Yale, what makes it exceptional is the ability to understand societies, institutions, communities, culture in a way that forments us in a different way so that we can participate in a global basis. It is not about being exceptional. It is about having a relationship that is exceptional. And so I also want to kind of take a step back because this is at the nature of my work. Um, the nature of my work is to view it through the lens from a native perspective. And so there are a lot of traditions. In Lakota, they call this Ikshe Wishkasha, um, Samoan Lautele, Native Hawaiian maka, maka Ainana. It is the commoner, right? And, and so when we think about the commoner, I, I think we sometimes gloss over it. And in the reality, they are at the primacy and central to much of the work we do. And so it really requires us to have the heart, the eyes, the ears of the communities we serve. And so by centering on that, we keep focus. It creates a balance, an equilibrium, and a harmony to the work we do so we don't get too above it. So it doesn't become theoretical. So it is not abstract. It is the thing that is before us. Um, and so I, I think, you know, that is the tension at being at a place like Yale. We are all striving. We're all trying to be the best iteration of ourselves. But I think at times we need to take a step back and, and really think about um, the nature of the work we want to do and of the communities we want to really be servants to. Um, and that's, I think, especially true um, within a place like Andover, the Yale School of Divinity, and the Yale School of Environment. You know, I've had many kinds of, you know, questions about like, what's it to be at Yale? And I have to say, I was like, it's wonderful because the people, the students, the faculty, everyone I work with in many ways is so earnest. Um, and so there's a grounding that is already here. And what I'm, you know, really talking about is how do we refine some of that? How do we make connectivity so we can peer into these communities that we really do a lot of work on behalf? And so the other thing that I would like us to take pause on is to really um, reconsider our constructs of love. Um, and I have to, you know, give a shout out. Um, this thought comes from Molly. Um, I was speaking to her about this. And our love, I think, is essentially always pure. But somehow along the way, it can create its own kind of biasness to it, its own kind of path that we think is maybe highfalutin, or we want to approach it in a certain way. And so much like philanthropy, which operates at its core with benevolence and love, it can still be paternalistic. It can still be parochial. It can still be putative. And so we need to really consider um, how that is expressed and what kinds of judgments and histories we have packed into our love. <clears throat> so, kind of pivoting back to this concept um, of looking through the, the common person's eyes, 
By utilizing the eyes and the spirit of the common person, we regulate that portion. We balance it, and we place it in the appropriate cultural and spiritual context. So I, I really want to encourage you about thinking about that and being intentional about the communities that you work with. All right, second pithy observation. As I went through um, Luke 24, what um, also came out to be, there are no fewer than 10 action verbs, going, coming, went, vanished, stayed, returned, things of that nature. And I would like us to consider that these movements are a really nice parallel to the movements of our own communities, and specifically restorative justice. So I, I think it's obvious that I might bring this up, um, but let's like explore what Jesus has, has said about action. The entire book of John basically is about a treatise on operating from action. And we have the highest example, Christ sacrificing his life for our salvation. Nothing can be more emblematic of an action, right? So we're, as we read through John, it is just kind of filled with Christ wants action and not just mere words. So let us love with not words and speech, but with actions and truths. So these I think examples as we kind of integrate this into contemporary native topics, I've seen this in land acknowledgments and then in a bigger kind of thing, the, the recent repudiation of the doctrine of discovery by the Catholic Church. Um, it, both of these things require something over than a statement and an observation, right? Um, I won't go into a lot into it right now, but you know, a land acknowledgement is a correct thing to do. Um, it, it is historical attribution. However, it is not historical correction. You have merely pointed something out that is obvious to that native person. And it is nice that you have made this acknowledgement, but there's a second part of that. And it is restorative justice. It is an action to say, how can I contribute to making you whole. And it's the same thing with the Catholic Church. Um, if you think about the doctrine, um, it is something that we kind of currently live with now and has changed entire indigenous communities as well as, as agrarian societies. Um, and this has been true for the last 700 years. I want to add one last pithy point. When we practice justice, whether it be restorative or biblical justice, it is not just an outcome, an objective, or an institutional kind of deliverable. It is a mirror of God. So when we practice justice, we are an element. We are an essence. We are reflecting godliness in our actions. And so it is a path that has a very clear delineation. And so this action really allows us to commune with God when we practice it. So I, I want to say, if we want to really be true to his word, we are instructed to carry out through actions, movements, campaigns, and advocacy. These are all physical kind of manifestations of justice. but. I want to take a pause right there because before we move into any kind of like big movements, before we do anything, to my first point, we have to make an assessment of where we are in these relationships. Too often, our first reaction, almost axiomatically, is to run to this big campaign, this big movement. We want a deliverable, we want productivity. And this is especially um, true at a place like Yale. And so we have this Western um, construct that is predicated that we have to be immediate. What we have not answered is, what is the status of our relationship as we speak? And so why do we need to take pause? Why do we need to meditate? And it's for a simple reason, historical trauma. All Native communities are saddled with historical trauma. 
And we really need to have a deep and robust understanding of this historical trauma. Um, as I talk about the doctrine of discovery um, and our friends, Pope Alexander and Pope Nicholas, and their decision to split the world in half and then parcel it off to Spain and Portugal um, and basically then say, evangelize Catholicism, but also along the way, pick up as much real estate as you can. Because um, really, that was at the primacy of the doctrine. This doctrine is not history. It is today. It is what instructs Indian law and policy without doing one of my classes, which is terribly boring. Um, we get to a point, right? And there's a series of these seminal cases called the Marshall Trilogy. Long story short, three things come out of the Marshall Trilogy. One, states cannot instruct um, tribes. Um, they're distinct um, with the federal government sitting on the top of the pyramid. Two, the federal government has this fiduciary relationship to tribes. That sounds fanciful, but it's not. It is a incredibly paternalistic, and in fact, they use it in the same um, kind of verbiage of parent to child and issues of competency. Um, and so we have this very subordinated relationship. And third, and most kind of practically speaking, it is how we got the modern day concept of Indian title that tribes do not own lands, they only have a right of possession and occupancy, um, and they don't have negotiability. Um, and so as all this is going on, you know, one of the things that is contemporary and consistent in American policy to tribes um, is assimilation. It's remarkable though, the one kind of point of assimilation about land title, which is a Western construct, um, for all of us probably, the, the single most important kind of asset we'll have is our land and house, and we'll pass it on, and it will create legacy wealth. They never gave that to tribes. Why is that? So you want, to, you want tribes to assimilate, but you want to neuter them. You want to make them flaccid, and they have no ownership of land. So we have a picture of the situation with tribes. But the other thing that has to be said about this is there is a violent history attached to all of this. And this violent history is the playbook of genocide. One, let me take your lands. Two, let me call out and call your God subordinated, flaccid, and lower to my God. Let me suggest another God to you. What can be more putative than saying your God is not sufficient? And then you victimize the women. You sexually assault the women and then you snatch the children and you assimilate them into boarding schools. That is part of the history of Native Americans and most Native people. Taking of lands, assimilation are the thematic kinds of parentheticals that is always tethered to this history. And so when you think about that, what is the outcome? The outcome is a community that has mistrust. And this mistrust is ubiquitous. Um, I was telling someone, in all of my work, and I've probably done this going on four decades now, the first thing I have to do is not hear about what the Native community wants to do or what I want to do for them. It is to simply be before them and create a bridge of trust to let them know that I will have a consistency of my words and my actions because all I'm trying to do is develop a relationship. And that is really thematically what I'm putting before you today. How do we rethink and develop these relationships? Um, a great kind of thought to this, so it can be really tangible, is I think everyone in the room knows this word aloha. Um, and, you know, is it love? Yes. But if you were to break down the word, 
it is so demonstrative. Allo, to be in front, face to face with someone. Um, ha, to give your essence, to give your, your knowledge, to give your love. And so I really want you to think about of how you interface with the community. You interface them so they can see you for all that you are. Um, I, when I was younger, I was part of a halal for many years and I had a kumu and he told me um, that upon death, a kumu, a teacher, would give to Haumana a student, ha, he would give him the knowledge or she the knowledge as well as the breath of love. And so the spirit of that person was transferred from teacher to student. And we need to think about it in that way. We want to be authentic. We want to be the, the most kind of candid version of ourselves, not some highfalutin version. The, the, the version that a person can see and is consistent from day to day, from month to month, from year to year. And that is really the essence of the work, um, that we don't try to go in and immediately fix things, that, that philanthropic model. I often kind of analogize, this is much like a personal relationship. And many instances, my wife, um, she doesn't want me to come in and save her. What she wants is my ear. She wants my spirit in front of her. And some of that means to just be silent, to just have a presence with a person or community that while we may not say anything, evokes love. It just says, I'm here. I may not know everything you're going through, but I am willing to sit with you. And while the Silence, I think, at times can be uncomfortable. There is a transfer, transferring of spirit that occurs during these things. And so sometimes we have to sit with ourselves and we have to sit with this individual or we have to sit with a community. And that is what we have to do to reestablish relationships. Um, so now we can talk about maybe restorative actions. Um, whether it be with individuals or bodies or religious institutions. So as we start, you know, one of the things I, I think about is this really beautiful and simple African um, proverb. Remember, these communities are hurt. The ax always forgets, but the tree always remembers. The second thing that I think about are they're just incredibly elegant words of Dr. Martin Luther King during his Christmas sermon. That life is interrelated. We all are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are all in this together. I think about this when I talk about how we think about land and how we should, in some ways, emulate a native perspective of the land, that the land is an extension of ourselves. It is not the outdoors, it is not recreation, it is not a wilderness area, it is not a conservation easement. It is an extension of ourselves and how we appropriately take care of it, it takes care of us. Um, my mentor, um, Dr. Emmett Aluli, um, who recently died, and we'll talk to, about him in a second, um, had a wonderful idiom to this. The health of the land is the health of the people. And that is same for us as a community. So um, there's another word that's in Greek. I could not get the Greek linguist um, team. <laughs> Anakinosis? Anakinosis? Biblical languages? Is this not a requirement at Yale Divinity anymore? Where is the damn dean of curriculum around here? All right, it's an action noun, right? It describes renewal, and that's what we're really trying to do. It is a transformation for renewal. 
simply, you know, put, it is to reconsider how we go about this. That we don't have to be tethered to the past. We also have the option of always creating a new iteration. And so, no matter how kind of vast or difficult the work is, that is always a different option, renewal. And so, I want us to consider restoration as like Psalms um, puts it. He who heals the brokenhearted and blinds all up their wounds is really similar to what Ephesians talks about. Your words can either build or tear down. And so again, this refrain, let's keep our words and our actions consistent. Our words are incredibly powerful. Think about it. God created all of this just through words. It's an powerful kind of vehicle. And so when we think about our words, let's use them to edify, to promote, to advance, and to really elevate the spirit, soul, and body of one another and the communities we work with. So, you know, over and ab um, above, you know, land acknowledgments, um, it is a natural segue to me for land back. Um, when I think about this, you know, you have land acknowledgement and then you have land back. And land back is way over here. But I want you to think about land back as a restorative um, action to native communities because some of you, if you took, took Professor Wegner's class, probably have the concept that the First Amendment is, doesn't really apply to Native peoples. Um, it doesn't have the same application. So when we think about returning ancestral lands to Native communities, what we're actually saying is, we want you to be in the place that is in organic and seamless for you to practice your theology. We are giving back spirituality back to native people because the land is the altar. It is the cathedral. The same way that a Catholic would think about the cathedral of Notre Dame, a titular kind of structure um, to Gothic architecture and Catholicism is the same thing that the bear's ears is to the five tribes I represented. It is their altar. And to desecrate either here or there or someplace in the middle is to really ameliorate the robustness of their own kind of worship. And so land back is not just giving land back. It is to re-kind of emphasize that your spirituality is important, that the landscape is important for you to have a traditional and cultural practice. So, as I look up in time, I want to get to Andover and Yale Divinity. I think they have an incredibly um, remarkable role to play in this. Um, and it, it is because the American Board of Commissioner and Foreign Churches and what that means um, to the Native Hawaiian community. You know, the, the fact that you just celebrated um, your 200th year anniversary um, is fantastic. And I'm, I'm not saying you've ended it, but there is something more. Um, and there's always something more. So what remains to that? So let's open up the door to these Native communities, whether it be Native Americans, um, First Nations, or Native Hawaiians. Let's encourage that we have a greater Native population at these institutions. Let's encourage the idea that Native perspectives of theology are important to the tapestry of the academic discourse here. Let's think about really solidifying specific scholarship to Native people. With that, I also want to talk about, um, and this is a, a personal kind of um, endeavor of mine, is, is that um, here at Yale, the, the first um, Native American is Henry Rowcloud. Henry Rowcloud graduated in 1910, and then he got a master's in 1914. Um, However, 
And this is not to um, not promote and celebrate, because we should celebrate. He was the first Native American at Yale. However, there was a Native Hawaiian here five years earlier. Um, and he is the progeny of my mentor. And so there's a bias there. But this person, if you have any doubt, his name was Noah Webster. He was named after Noah Webster. Class of, they call it the great class of 1778 Yale. The namesake, Noah Webster Aluli, was here five years. So I instruct, I plead, I ask of this institution to make recognition to the Aluli Ohana, to the Native Hawaiian community, because you have an intersection. It is a rich intersection that should be recognized. This man graduated from Yale Law School in 1905. Um, he is a part of the history. And he will not supplant Henry Rowe Cloud, but he certainly has a place. He is a native. Um, Dr. Emmett Aluli, as I kind of alluded to, was not just my mentor, he was my wife's mentor. Um, and he, he operated with an abundancy of love. Um, when I think about the things that he gave me and the difficult work, um, so much of my life I wanted to kind of emulate who he was. And I know the work is complex. It can be very tense and uncomfortable. But the three things um, that I will close with, which I tell my class, is the three things that will facilitate that are the kind of the WD-40 that God has given us, love, gratitude, and joy. These things will overcome the missteps that you might take, the, the tense situations, and they will also elevate you and all around you. It is the reason that a person like me, and I don't say this to be self-deprecating because I'm probably the least bright person in this room, has been able to navigate this path to speak for, before you today. It is because I'm instructed by love. Um, I have a profound gratitude. Um, I told my class today, Yale is great, but the single biggest and most kind of positive impression, as well as takeaway, were the students. They have given me so much. Aloha my no aloha aku. When love is given, it must be returned. And it is from that that I operate. And it is why I always have joy. Because I know that I come from a place of love. And if I'm incorrect, it allows me to make correction and ask forgiveness. So with that today, love, gratitude, and joy. Thank you. Also, the dean. <laughs> something uh, I know you've thought about because I've come to you for advice on this very question. We have a number of leaders in congregations who are adopting the practice of offering a land acknowledgement at the beginning of worship services. And on the one hand, I think it's a beautiful step, but on the other hand, we don't want to engage in... Um, what is the word that you used? Pedantic lip service? Something along those lines. We don't, want, um, we don't want anything that happens in a worship space to be superficial and um, detached from Christian action. 
So I just wonder for those who might either be religious leaders or, be, or uh, studying to become religious leaders, what is your counsel for what steps would lead us to a more, um, a more wholesome and fulsome land acknowledgement in settings like New England congregations? Yeah, so, you know, um, one, I'm, I'm, I'm not like, you know, an encyclopedia of best practices, but I can tell you this. Um, it, it is a first step, and what you really have to allow is a developing conversation. Land acknowledgement, but what else can we do? What is it important to you um, to make whole? What is a remedy for you? for me as an individual or collectively as an institution. And to advance this idea that while we've made this recognition, there is still the, the heavy lift involved. And in fact, that is the practice right there, right? How do we make this whole? And it's to really kind of expose yourself to the idea of you tell me. And I think where the challenge is, is people don't want to put themselves in that position, right? Because now you have to honor that. You then have to have a requisite amount of energy as well as effort and maybe even resources to then meet that. But that is part of it. If you're going to be restorative justice, um, it can't be just, all right, I acknowledge this and now I want to bounce. Um, that there's a particular kind of moral and intellectual sloth to that kind of thinking. It is to kind of put it before the community and for them to articulate, we would love to have your assistance in A, B, and C. And so it is really as basic as asking. Thank you, thank you, Pat. I see a question, uh, I'm gonna start with Noah and then come to Courtney. This is Noah Humphrey from the great state of Hawaii. Aloha. Um, again, I'm a settler of a Sav. I'm a settler of a Sav or nation. Again, I'm originally from South, the Central LA. But the work I do in Kalihi, a place that means so much to me. And in that place, it's called K Vibe. And for like the UFO over there, I am referred to as Kuya, which is Tagalog for guardian, protector. And that is key. For me, the work that I've done here at Yale is that I got the first black student at Yale, his rightful degree. So again, it can be done, one, but also two, how do we heal from a past that has broken us again and again. As in we are, we are always promised words of healing, of communication, of guidance, but not given the right respect that it, that it deserves. And being keen on that, being keen on how do we, as representatives of that land, give back to people here because I know that the pipeline between me and Hawaii is not just for me. It is so that other like people besides me can go. And I want to leave a space for them to be here. So how do we, as Yale Divinity students, give that space to those on the land? It's a, it's a great question. I, I, I think I may not be, answer, um, be able to answer it in its entirety. What I would say is to, and this is for myself, is I try to think about individual relationships. What can I do for this individual? Um, because when we're thinking about a collective kind of body that may have a, just a heinous history that spans three to 400 years, it, it is hard for one person to kind of remedy that and so I really think about what can I do in a day-to-day -day, a week-to-week -week basis that in the aggregate I'm advancing this in a way um, that I create a particular kind of momentum or a movement um, to these actions um, and, and in that way you can then 
peer in and see some movements. I think sometimes as a kind of a collective kind of group or institution, it is hard to see that in, in retrospect. And so what we need is more individuals doing it so that we coalesce individuals' actions to a more collective kind of um, thing in which now we have momentum. Um, but you, you, you make a, a really kind of discernible point about the difficulty of the work. Thank you, Pat. Now is your Courtney Estevez. Thank you so much. Um, my question um, is with regard to a topic that has been discussed um, in the Yale Divinity community recently, which is regarding a piece of art that is in, um, or that was in one of our chapels um, that has a depiction of Christ as a Native American, actually painted by a non-Native Jesuit priest. And this artwork was removed, not at all, at least on the official level, not because of the native Christ, but rather because of the presence on that artwork of Jean Vanier, who um, committed heinous sexual violence. And so I know at least rhetoric among the students is also trouble around the native Christ, especially as painted by a non-native Jesuit priest specifically because of the connections to the boarding schools that you mentioned and so many other devastating parts of the history. I just wonder, I wanted to, one, name that just in this space um, for any who are not aware of this ongoing topic because the artwork has been removed very recently and now it's a blank space in our chapel. And so the conversation is a very open one of what replaces that. And I've been giving a lot of thought and reflection these days to what is restorative justice in artwork in sacred spaces, um, thinking on many levels of people who are survivors of sexual violence, people in the disability justice community, people in the native communities and all of the overlaps in those communities. And so I guess what I'm winding up to a question here is just your, your thoughts for us as we have this literal blank space in one of our sacred spaces, what could restorative justice, particularly mindful that that space was once occupied by a native depiction of Christ painted by a non-native artist, what, what could restorative justice be there? I mean, yeah. I, I think about this, but I, I do think there's an opportunity, and I'm not saying this is the definitive way um, to look at this, but because of the connection of Andover and AP, ABMC, um, I think there might be an opportunity to go back um, to um, the institutions in Hawaii, like Kauai Ha'o Church, to say um, there might be an opportunity. Do you have some insight from a perspective that we would like to represent here um, at Andover? Um, and, and in that way, um, I always think about these things in terms of you have to create a posit, but the answer has to come from the community. And so while you advance it, you leave open to say, you actually fill in the most important part of this sentence. And I would maybe consider something like that. Thank you so much, uh, Pat. I have a, a follow-up question um, that relates to that outreach, that relationship building, that foray into relationship building. And the way I want to ask the question, just knowing that you know my sense of humor, is how do you not be a jerk? How do you not be just a jerky, awful, awkward, uh, ham-handed person when you make that first outreach? So I'm imagining the congregational leader who is, um, who is coming into a setting where they're talking about land acknowledgement. They want to begin a dialogue. And I have colleagues whose churches have actually given their churches, given, done land back with their churches, and now they rent their own, the church that they had thought of themselves as owning for generations. But the first phone call to say, let's get into a dialogue could come across very much like, I want you to make me feel better, or I, want, I feel guilty, and I want you to make me feel less guilty if it's not handled really well. So how do we handle it well? Like anything else, I think it's a, it is a practice. And so you know, a lot of that is taking the I out of it. I, whatever, this is not about you. Um, and there has to be a profundity of humility 
Um, you know, often when I talk to communities, I don't even get to engage in the substantive part of the work um, until several months in because in many ways, um, I talk about this bridge, but also you have to realize, especially for someone that I kind of walk between different doors, um, I hold the psychic energy of these parties, whether it is a native community or an institution that I may be representing. And I have to also serve as a vessel for them to have a cathartic experience. And that cathartic experience might very much be F you. Um, <laughs> but I don't take that personally because I know that there is hurt and there is trauma. Um, and that I don't always have the particular answer. In fact, I try to restrain myself in, in being in that kind of problem solving. Um, and that is to really allow the, the group or the individual to express themselves in a way knowing that I may not even have the engagement that I even contemplate until maybe a fifth or sixth meeting. And so it is to kind of take this in. Um, and I think that is very much in the kind of pastoral traditions that many of you are becoming versed in is how do you absorb this portion of the community? And so it is the fear and intimidation of, the, of this other side that you may not have a lot of knowledge from both a cultural or a historical perspective. And creating an engagement so they can express themselves and allowing that to organically take place so then you can actually have a conversation. Um, and, and so some of that for me, and I say this all the time, it is humility and I'm not a very humble person. So <laughs> if I can do it, I think many of you can. It is to kind of you know, um, take it in and not to go into a, like a very judgmental place with it because it is an expression, a frustration that has in many ways, you're a, a sliver of a, you know, a 50 ton anvil that came before you. You just happen to intersect it at that point. I think I speak for all of us when I say this. This has been tremendous, tremendous food for thought and we're, so grateful for your wisdom. Let's give our lecturer a round of applause.